Welcome back to daytime here on Rogers TV. Well, the book is called Under Pressure by Carl Honoré, and it's talking about the phenomenon of, of hyper-parenting and really what it's doing to our kids these days. And really interesting discussion with Carl Honoré. Carl, we left uh, the last segment talking about sort of the effect that it's having on children. I wanted to point out as well that the interesting thing about your book is you didn't write it like a parenting yeah. manual. Yes. And this is important to point out to the viewers because, uh, like you said in your own words, there are too many of them now. Yeah. People are going to manuals. <laughs> yeah. Was this a was this a concerted effort? Did you make sure that you didn't write it in that style? Very much so. And I think that parenting manuals have become part of the problem rather than the solution. And that as parents, we face this wall of sound of advice, this barrage of suggestions and tips and, and advice that that's much of it contradictory. And I think what it ends up doing at the end of the day is eroding our confidence. Mm -hmm. And it kind of drowns out that little inner voice that we all carry as parents, that voice that tells us, you know what, I know who I am, I know who my children are, I know what they're good at, I know what their strengths are, and I'm going to find my style of parenting. That just gets pushed aside in this dash to follow whatever the latest trend is. And I think that a big part of what I was writing the book was to do, was to make people just take a a deep breath and relax and feel, right. you know, it's going to be okay because because it almost always is. You know? I mean, yes, that's just, yeah. it's true. It almost yeah. always is. And, I'm, you know, and, and I think that's a big first step for parents is just to think, you know, I don't have to turn my child's childhood into a rat race. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the, the other reassuring side of the equation is that many of these tools of hyperparenting, all the kind of, whether it's Baby, Baby Einstein DVDs or Mozart in the womb yes. or endless extracurriculars, <laughs> they don't actually do what it says on the box. You know, they, they're backfiring and it makes much more sense, all the research shows scientifically, but all the anecdotal evidence from around the world that when you back off and you give children the time and space to explore the world on their own terms, to, to play, mm -hmm. that that's yeah. when they develop their social skills, it's when they learn how to think creatively, it's when they learn who they are rather than what we want them to be. Right. I'm glad you mentioned the word play because a, a, a big portion of the book, actually a chapter dedicated to it, is toys. Toys and technology and we're buying our kids these toys that have bells and whistles and lights and it's almost like there, it's doing the imagining for the child. The child mm -hmm. doesn't use any imagination. Speak on that a little bit. That's very true, and I think that's part of the, this broader shift in p parenting culture, the idea that something is better if you spend more money on it. Right. And that's very much not the case with toys, that a lot of these toys do too much. And the more a toy does with beeps, whistles, you know, whiz-bang gadgetry, the less the child is invited to do. And what toys really are, apart from just sheer pleasure and fun, mm -hmm. is giving children that stimulus. It's giving them the space, giving them a starting point, and then they take the little doll, the wood uh, horse, and they invent a story, they build a narrative around it. And if everything is laid out for them, if everything is spoon-fed, then the, the child's imagination doesn't have room to, to breathe, it doesn't have room to expand. And of course that's what we want to do for children, is to give them space to, to be imaginative, especially in this, even if all we care about is the global economy, and we want, we want creative workers, we don't care if the children are happy, they'll right. be more creative if they've had time to play. <laughs> and you saw it firsthand, didn't you? Uh, you? You saw kids that were given building blocks and, and to mm -hmm. wooden toy trains, and they were also given a, a bunch of high-tech gadgets. They didn't even touch the high-tech gadgets yeah. after about five minutes. That's right, and that was an amazing experience. I was at a, a toy experiment, like a kind of Pepsi Coke challenge type scenario right. in, in Argentina, and that's right, the, the toys were there, and the kids, you know, they gravitated at first, a few them to the high-tech gadgets, but, but they lost interest. And, and one of them said to me, you know, we have a lot of these at home, but, but they get boring after a while. They're always the same. And they ended up doing the simple stuff, Lego. You remember yes. Lego? Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And, the, and at, the end of the, at the end of the session... Hours and hours of oh, fun, they, that. They had about 15 kids <laughs> clustered around this mountain of Lego, yeah. you know, building things and quietly thinking, helping each other out with wheels. And it was just, it was immense, immensely inspiring, but also it made me feel so relaxed. You know, I thought, right. you know, it, it is okay. You know, the simple stuff just put them out in the garden, let them play in the sandpit, that kind of stuff that's always worked. You know, Carl, you, you're talking about the simple things, and, and it, it sort of reminds me, it leads me into wanting to ask you about your previous book, which mm. really, Under Pressure almost seems like a, the perfect sequel, even though it's not a sequel, to your first book, In Praise of Slow, where you really talk about the emerging, the slow movement, yeah. and all of the principles of that, and slowing down, and sort of getting back to basics. Can you speak on the slow movement and give our viewers a little education on what it is? Sure. Well, well, the slow movement is a kind of cultural revolution, if you like. And I know those are big words, but I think, I think they, they stand up. And it's a, it's a reaction against this fast-forward culture we live right. in, the idea that, that faster is always better and that more is always more. And mm -hmm. slow, the whole kind of slow ethos is about doing things as well as possible instead of doing them as fast as possible and giving each thing the time and attention that it deserves, you know, mm -hmm. putting 
quality before quantity. And once you take that idea, you can apply it to everything. So there are kind of slow work movements, slow sex, slow design, slow art, slow architecture, slow cities, slow food. You know, <laughs> yeah. it goes on and on. Maybe even slow TV one day. Right. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and it's something that just, once you make that little click in your head and you realize that living like a roadrunner may feel exciting and stimulating and productive, but really it's not. And you end up running through your life instead of actually living it. And all over the world now, you find people stepping back and saying, you know what, there are different speeds here. Sometimes fast is good, but sometimes slow is good too. We even see slow in, in, in the book under pressure as far as academics go. A lot of schools are, are really changing the way they're teaching children. In particular, Italy. There's a school system in Italy. Can you speak on this one in particular? I think it's called Reggio. Reggio, yeah, that's right, yes. It's a, it's a school system that started in Italy. It's a preschool system. Okay. And, and it's been spread around the world now. And what it does is it, it kind of gives children that space, that creative space, with lots of interesting objects and you know, art equipment, but it doesn't have a curriculum. And right. it doesn't force children to sit at a desk and work on their pencil control when they're three. Right, you know, yes. All this academic, <laughs> this academic cramming that you find around the world, which actually doesn't work, it turns out. Um, but in, in Reggio, you, you, the children kind of call the shots in a way. So they will maybe see some birds flying across the sky, and that will lead to a whole two months investigating and learning about migration. And they'll learn about feathers and you know, nature and so on. The teacher is in the classroom, obviously, right. guiding and steering gently. But essentially, it's the children. And that, that's really what true learning is, isn't it? When children, something sparks them. And they disappear, like, you know that wonderful quote from William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand and hold infinity in the palm of your hand. That timeless moment when children just disappear into something, whether it's a ladybug on a flower or a, you know, a, a twig in the sandbox, that, that magic of childhood. And that's one of the things that Red Joe brings back. And you know, it allows children to, to, to unleash their curiosity. And then, of course, they go on and thrive in schools later on. I am so relaxed now. I Just really that am whole, too. What a beautiful <laughs> way to end the interview. Carl, thank you so yeah. much thank for you. joining us it's today. It's a must read for every parent It really is there. a must read under pressure. And the other book is In Praise of Slow. Go to his uh, website, carlhonore.com, for more information. Be right back after this.